Um, so as a, as a question to start, how, how can art play a role in political activism in a way that other typical forms of polit like, from political protest can't? Maybe Waikido is getting uh, her headset at her. Do you want to answer that, Tanya? Uh, okay. So, yeah, basically I think uh, part of what we get with art that we don't get in other realms of protest or, or you know, reimagine the world is the fact that people can be um, a little more challenging. You know, you can be more disrespectful, you can be more um, go to zones of non-comfort neither for you or for the person. And I think this is, um, I think it's a very useful tool to, to question what we're living around, because we are too polite. I think we are too polite. <laughs> and then sometimes you forget that in order to generate change, you need to be direct and talk, you know, speak to power, you know. Well, Hedo, what about you? Maybe you could give us an example for people who haven't seen your work before of uh, a time that one of your ideas for art has actually impacted real change, it, whether that is politically or getting people who have experienced one of your uh, um, exhibits to change their mind about something. To be honest, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, one thing that I find really interesting about this, uh, the concept of the collective as well, because even as an artist, there's an individual way that you can then uh, impact a larger group of people. Um, I just recently got back from Cuba earlier this year, where I got to, um, to feel like the collective of the power of Cuba. Um, how can you try to use art in order to get a large group of people to change their minds about something, rather than you just personally impacting something? I mean, there are different ways. It's not only one way, but I think also, like you doing your work, knowledge is important. You know, this idea that through the work we, at least every time I see your work, I, I learn something that I didn't know. Um, and I think in, in my case is that, like, how can you provide information in a way that is, uh, I don't know, for people to, to understand what's going on. That's what I think when I see your work sometimes, like I learn through a different wire, it's not like direct knowledge, like it's not the definition, it's more about, I don't know, no, learning I mean, honestly, I'm trying to think through this as a form of installation and what kind of effect it produces because, I mean, literally, I'm an installation artist and I tell you, if anyone wanted to materialize the idea of a filter bubble, then this is what this would look like, no? I mean, this installation in itself, by its form, already has the effect of completely dividing people from one another. I have no idea who I'm talking to. Perhaps there's just no one listening at all, or maybe people are listening to Spotify. Actually, I would do that, you know, honestly. So, I mean, what kind... This is not a public sphere. This is not a public discussion. This is something I've called in my writing a pubic discussion, right? Yeah, it's when... Basically, the concept of public does no longer exist because people are isolated, they are atomized within their headphones, within their sphere of intimacy, and yet there's the pretense of that being some kind of public. This is not public. This is a filter bubble. This is the Airbnb of, you know, a public staging. This is ridiculous. Sorry. What would you do to change it? Or what, or what in this moment that you have right now do we want well, to do to change I, I it? I will just address it. I mean, what, what else can I do? No? I mean, I'm here to honor Tanya's work, which I think is amazing. Over decades I followed it, and this is what I'm doing. But this is not a public discussion. This is the contrary of public. Should I just, in a vague attempt to engage the public that is watching in front of us, even though we are being live-streamed to everyone else right now, does someone have a question and want to engage? To, you know, install platform capitalism as a sort of spatial form, then this would be it, no? Yeah. Does anyone want to help us try to break that? A question? A piece of political activism? No? Okay. I'll keep, oh, we've got, we've got a question, <laughs> at the, question at the back, up here. Do you want to come to the front of the stage? Sorry. with you because we are in display also. Yeah. We are being displayed. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's, like, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. 
So I was just completely intrigued by the work you're doing. And I was just wondering whether you could tell us a bit more about the work you're doing, because I really like the examples you showed to us. Thank you. Uh, the work I'm doing right now, you mean? Okay. Uh, so right now, I'm a little frustrated because I want to do work about Trump, but he's changing all the time the stuff, so I cannot follow him. So that's the frustration I have. But I think also part of what I do is uh, long-term or short-term work. So sometimes the pieces I show is very short-term, so it's just something I do to create some reaction and discussion. But then I do, I do this piece, which is the Institute of Art and Activism, which is a long-term, maybe 10, 15, 20 years piece. And uh, it is important uh, for me to understand what needs time. Sometimes when you make just a judgment or, or a quick uh, assertion in the work, uh, there is a violation of time in a way. So you are, um, uh, I, I, talk, I talk about the political time, you know, this is why I like the idea of political timing because uh, sometimes many things that we see is just a kind of abusive uh, forcing political moment through art instead of giving the time for people to develop with it. So I think this is, uh, I go between both. So I think some ideas need to be aggressive and needs to be like, for example, Hito's statement about where we are right now, I love it. There needs to be addressed in a very clear and rapid way. Other things are about building up uh, different, like a re different social, I don't know, rewiring or something like this. But, uh, so I'm working now in the Institute in Cuba and uh, inviting artists, like hopefully Hito one day, uh, and other artists to come and share their experience uh, and react to that reality. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that you bring up the concept of time. The last talk that we saw, Marianne Wolf was talking about like the importance of deep reading and contemplation. And I think that's another way that, as opposed to, I'm a, I'm a journalist, and I think that we will absorb the same, uh, the same message, a political message differently through a 400 word article that we read on our phones rather than something that you take the time to actually experience in an art gallery. I'm, I'm curious, what other, aside from Trump, what other areas are you looking at to agitate right now? The neo-fascism that's going around in the world now. Um, it's interesting because uh, it's very easy to criticize the ex-socialist places, you know, and the failure, but we are right now seeing the failure of, hopefully, the failure of capitalism, I hope. I don't think it's going to be the total failure, but it is at least a crisis, and um, yeah. So I think this neo-fascism as a solution is related to time, because it's a way to, to solve things quickly, instead of taking the time to building a community, building uh, ethics, you know. Uh -oh. So, you live here, maybe you've seen yes, it. I mean, one also has to say that the fall of the Berlin Wall, at least in Germany, is the starting point for the renormalization of racism, anti Semitism, violence against foreigners. This starts with 9th of November 89. You know, people were asked today, what did you do during the fall of the Berlin Wall? But what did people do all these 30 years after, right? I mean, this time is completely swallowed. And I can't tell you what happened these 30 years after. Racism, uh, anti-foreigner sentiment and neo-fascism got normalized also in Europe, not only in the United States, Eastern Europe, basically in, in, in all around us. Um, I, I recently really enjoyed, although from afar, your 2019 Venice Biennale installation, which was all about AI and kind of the impact that it has on us. And for me, I was just thinking of Shoshana Zuboff's uh, um, wonderful, wonderful words before. Um, I, if you guys both watched her discussion, was there something that maybe jumped out about like truth that she was bringing to this? Well, I agree, <laughs> 100 percent. I think she was very, very clear. And the thing that happens today is like all of us are too passive. We see things happening around and we don't do anything because it's not our problem, because it's too complicated, no? And uh, yeah, the fight is, uh, yeah, you have to keep being the asshole in the room saying the wrong things, you know, and, and pushing people to rethink what they're doing that is not so good. Well, you know, 
and it's part of this timing. Everybody wants to have fun and quick, you know? Everybody wants to have things fun and quick. With jokes. TED Talk style. Yeah. Did you just yeah, bring yeah. us something that you want to show us? This is my newest gadget. It's really ah. revolutionary and futuristic. It's a non-smart phone. It's a dumb phone. I think this is really the future. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also what Shoshana Tsuba was talking about, no? I mean, I was one of the persons who started very early to do work about the digital sphere, the internet, blah, 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 and so on. <laughs> I'm also one of the person who is evacuating first, and I think this will, start, will this continue to happen. So what is the way that your life has changed now that you've started using the dumb phone rather than the smartphone? Uh, part of it is more complicated, but uh, it's just so much fun using it. It's worth it. <laughs> um, I've got friends who have dumb phones and they use them as bottle openers because they're not afraid yeah, of like breaking the glass. Totally. It's a very Australian yeah. thing for me to say. You can throw them. No, yeah. that's a very good thing. It's an object value also. Yeah. Uh, just to continue being the assholes in the room. I like this. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I also want to bring up, I'm, I'm really into the, uh, you, you both have criticized the arts funding model in, in the past and, you know, the arts funding model or the Tate Modern and how that got redone and um, you've always been very anti sackler and anti-other, so I'm, I'm curious, what can be done in order for, like, these, these kind of interventions, they do take money and that's either your money, someone else's money and I think it's very important that we can continue supporting artists to do this important work. But how would you but fix the funding model? This is, we always, I, at least as an artist, I always find that I am in a, in a um, um, kind of a blackmail by institutions because they always say, oh, we need the money. Yeah, but first of all, part of the problem is like, we need to demand to the governments to give money for the arts instead of trying to, to find more rich people to give money for the art alone, you know. And also, we should have, we state now has, this kind of ethical committees for the money. Because the fact that people are using now art to clean the money, wash the money, is completely disgusting. Uh, it is disrespectful for what we do as, as practitioners. But also, why today money has more value than other things? That's precisely what we wanted to do with changing the name of the building. And we use very consciously the word value and contribution in that little plaque that we put because we wanted people to understand that contribution is not only money. And this is part of what we live in right now. We live in a society where people only value money. There are other things, you know, like, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, very often we get stuck in the debate around sponsorship, in the debate around guilt, and I'm really not interested in that, you know, which sponsor is more, is worse than another, and I don't care. What I think is a set of principles, of transparent principles, which one could call a new deal for the art world, no? And this deal has to include principles around sponsorship, governance, environmental standards, and also pay. And also, there needs to be a discussion which cannot be a sort of yes-no referendum, but a sustained debate around what do we want from the art world? What kind of social function does it have? And I'm convinced it, that it has a really important social function, that it serves, you know, to... Uh, facilitate a debate which in the media because of you know clickbait and so surveillance capitalism and so on is no longer happening to the extent it did and we need to make that happen by you know establishing criteria for this new deal for museums and not you know talk about this or that sponsor I'm really bored by that and also, and also I think we need to reevaluate what are the conditions in which artists work you know, because many times you see this institution who spend hundreds of thousands of dollars maybe in a dinner, but then they don't pay the artists to do the work. Or they don't pay properly the people in the museum who work for them every day. So I think this is also 
do not to forget. It's not only about who give. Yeah. I mean, the biggest donors for museum are actually artists and the people working there because they donate their lifetime right. and their energy. And artists usually they don't get paid at all, right? And one tends to forget the energy and all the resources and contributions that people working in the art world make for museums. They are the biggest donors and they should be honored. Exactly. So I think that we need to break surveillance capitalism and also break art capitalism, it sounds like. Um, before I uh, open it back up to the room, do you two have any questions that you two want to ask each other? Or, Hito, anything that Tanya said in her talk that you want to ask more about, for an example? I know you work yeah, so well. Yeah, we know, we know each other very well, so... <laughs> Thanks for presenting us yeah, again. Thank you thank for you. coming. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's a big honor, I have to say. No, no, I'm say yes. so happy yeah, to yeah. always share I'm fine. stage so. with you. <laughs> this is its own little filter bubble right here of love. The, yeah. good, the good type of filter bubble. Um, does anyone have any questions that we, that we want to go forward with? Is that a yes? Yes, come up here. Thank you both for great work. Um, I'm interested in the role of art in the society. If we look at the global development goals, you know, the 17 goals that we have, we see that art and culture are literally not represented. There was, however, a group that did represent the art world as part of the civic society, but the voices didn't come across. I've been lucky to be part of the discussions, but it was interesting to see that the art sector, you know, wasn't mobilized or maybe didn't speak the languages to connect, to, be, to become part of these processes. And another uh, and related question to that, maybe I share just another example. Uh, last year we submitted a big international proposal, Challenge Value. How can art uh, challenge value? working with other disciplines. It was a proposal to European Union for Horizon 2020. We, we did not get it. We will pursue because we believe this is critically important. And I would like to ask you, uh, where do you see spaces where these conversations are happening? Uh, not just happening, but where action is happening and how can we collaborate to take this further? I think it's essential and the time is now. Thank you. I think we should not have any expectation of art because I'm very nervous every time art is taken so quickly into this kind of global discussions because what you have is a, is a watched out version of art, meaning the goody-goody version of art where everybody's happy. And my personal way to approach art is not to make people happy, but is to make people think and make, make people sometimes reevaluate what they have done um, and for that, you have to address things that are uncomfortable. So part of the problem of the role of art, when we talk at this huge UN level or big level or, or global or this kind of conversation, is hard because you saw the, let's say, the reduced version of my work, one that is only literally the coach, help us to say, oh, you're talking too much, just make one point. And you... You know, in a way, it's hard because it is simplifying. This is a problem we have with art becoming part of these discussions today, that it is becoming a fac uh, facilita, like uh, the easy version of itself, where the actual potential it has for change and for, and for disruption is eliminated. No, and then this is, I don't know, I mean, I am with you, I think we need to put art, in, in as art and culture, which is two different things, in here, but we need to not wait anything from art. So let the artists do what they do, you know, because this is also a problem that sometimes you participate in projects, people expect that you do certain things, and then, it's, then you're not doing art, you're doing, uh, I don't know, like an Excel you. sheet or whatever, you know, so yeah. Peter, what about you? What do you feel about government's involvement in arts and culture? If it should stay out or if it should actively support? Well, of course, I think they should actively support because this is a this is a public matter, right? And they are responsible for it. I think many of the problems with sponsorship, which we have seen over the past years, come from the fact that so many arts and cultures budgets have been completely slashed, no, or widely slashed. They are consequences of austerity. 
So I think the question is really, do societies think that art is a public good or not? And if yet, then of course it should be funded by public money. Yes. Can we get a raise of hands for who thinks that art should be a, considered a public good? Thank you. Yeah, sure. One, more, one last question, then we're probably going to have that. I had to giggle when you showed um, how you were reading Hannah Arendt through a speaker on the street and the reaction in bi building roads next to your house. Uh, what is the situation for you right now? What are the working conditions for you in Cuba? I mean, you are still working in there. Uh, you're not being kicked out so far. So how do you manage? No, no. Um, one of the technique of... Well, first of all, I laugh now because time has passed and I have digested all my pain and I want to ridiculize the government uh, as my, I don't know, my revenge, let's say, for what they do to the artists in Cuba. But it is a painful process, you know, here you show it and you make it easy, but it is a painful process. And in this moment, um, one of the techniques the government uses is to make people tired of you and your problems. So, for example, we have artists right now, we have an artist that every week is being picked out, picked, 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 and put into jail for a day or two. Of course, the first day he was put in, we had 300 likes, uh, free, free, but by the 10th time they're doing this, he had three likes, let's say, in Facebook, and all my friends in Cuba are like, oh no, again, you know? So one of the tactics they use is this. So what I have done, because I work for the Not Yet, so the Not Yet is also a way to see it as a system. So you know, kind of think what would be their next step. And then you, you position yourself there instead of here today. So which I know they were going to do this to me. So I decided to be out of Cuba for four months or five. So people rest a little bit about me being in prison. So next time uh, they, you know, And I'm trying to, actually, I don't want to be in prison. I don't want to be taken in prison. I don't think this is wrong. I, I don't enjoy it. But um, and this is why in the Institute we're trying to do our work on spite them. So if they take some of the people collaborating with us for interrogation, then we next day we do the event. So we never suspend any event. We always do event. We invited at the very beginning people And uh, they say you cannot go to Tanya's house for the workshop. And then we did it in the park. You know, so it is not about... Um, because when this kind of totalitarian system, where you confront them, you give them power. So it's about how can we take the power out of totalitarians. And this applies for here as well, by the way. Yeah. So, yeah. It's all the way we have time for, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hito. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and we will see you next year at the 31st anniversary of the Falling Walls. Thank you.